Namaste. Namaste. We welcome you all to our weekly sessions, Evenings with Shadalu. I am Alina, and together with Joel. Hi, Joel. Namaste, Alina. We are happy to be back. Namaste. Namaste. We are happy to be back and continue on the same subjects, uh, education and teenage issues. In the last two weeks, we already covered uh, in details some of the questions received from our viewers. And we will continue to, ask, to answer some questions in this session and other, other further topics will be discussed. Um, I would be very kindly uh, asking uh, Shadalu if he could uh, answer our first, first group of questions from a student. Uh, we had uh, a comment. Many famous poets in Europe, such as Samuel Coleridge, used to take opium to help their poetic inspiration. Steve Jobs, inventor of iPhone, uh, used to take drugs in his youth, and it is said to be the cause of his creativity. Is there a danger in taking drugs for increasing creativity? What about microdosing on drugs, as it is common with many industry leaders in Silicon Valley? Is there a better way to increase creativity? And another question from Kasi. What correlation is there between drugs and art? I see art of very dark nature to be produced by artists who consume this, especially in hip hop and maybe also other styles. In the guise of self-expression, there are depressing themes. Yes, both questions pertain to the use of drugs for creativity. And uh, there's a point to it, of course, and then there are limitations which we will look at. But the question, interestingly, uh, is of the example around Samuel Coleridge, a famous uh, poet, for those of you who are familiar with his poetry. And uh, the incident, which is very famous, and it is as if taught to children, when you are introduced to Coleridge's famous poem called Kubla Khan, you're taught that he was under influence of opium and this happened. So the story goes like this. He was taking opium whenever he needed to get into a certain state. Uh, sometimes perhaps it was for poetry. Sometimes it was just for the opium high, which he was addicted to. But one such on such occasion when he was in an opiated state, in a half sleep or a half trance, he had an entire poem, and he says about 300 lines, which came into him. And then he got up in that state and began to write it. And after having written some uh, 30 or 40 lines, his accountant came at the door, knocked at the door, which forced him to get up, meet the accountant. And after the interaction, when he came back, he had lost the thread. And he only recalled a few fragments, which he then added. And the poem, of course, is quite extraordinary. Even as young children reading it, you're struck by something, almost a feel, which is magical. And Sri Aurobindo actually makes a comment of it. So I will just read the first four or five lines of the poem so you get a feel of it. It's called Kubla Khan. It goes thus. In Zanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. And so it goes on, and there are lines which uh, stir uh, layers of magical feel, and then, of course, the whole thing breaks down when he's lost the thread, and he has only a few. It, it ends with these lines, his flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice and close your eyes with holy dread 
for he on honey dew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise so both the starting lines and ending lines you can see actually seem to touch domains of some higher consciousness and i was speaking to narad earlier about this poem and he said that uh, this these initial lines of alf the sacred river through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea it represents the divine light flowing down into the subconscious uh, the poem itself is so moving one is tempted to think that it is the result of his uh, opiated state and that's where the catch comes similarly steve jobs because he was post flower children phase when the hippie movement he was part of that whole uh, drug uh, f- culture and many felt that in a drug state their minds opened because they saw the world differently and the boundaries of their imagination were released and so on many attributed their creativity to the drugs what is interesting is those who did not take drugs were equally creative so the attribution is probably not justified but what it did to them though it broke the illusion of the purely materialistic world view to that extent it served but did it increase creativity and the same question can be asked of coleridge so here i want to read from sri aurobindo what he has to say about coleridge the comment he makes is of his own life he says i read shelley a great deal and took an intense pleasure in some of coleridge's poetry that's interesting for sure bindu to say that of course that was in his younger days and uh, then another comment which he makes specifically about uh, coleridge he says coleridge more than any other more than any of his great contemporaries missed his poetic crown he has only found and left to us three or four scattered jewels of a strange and singular beauty the rest of his work is a failure there is a disparateness in his gifts and inconsequence and incoherence which prevented him from bringing them together aiding one with the other and producing great work rich in all the elements of his genius intellectually he had in abundance a wide rich and subtle intellect but he squandered rather than used it in discursive metaphysics and criticism etc so i don't read more but this idea that incoherence inconsequence and the failure of much of his work sri aurobindo points to i would even attribute this to his opiated states and the poetic genius of course is uh, independent of this because it's as you can see not consistent whereas his opium was consistent so i can now come to another letter of sri aurobindo which is written to amal kiran where amal kiran is trying to play with this poem of Kubla, called kubla khan and then trying to improve upon it and so there sri aurobindo says sri aurobindo in writing in 1931 let me add that this poem of coleridge is a masterpiece not because it is the quintessence of romantic poetry but because it is a genuine supra physical experience caught and rendered in a rare hour of exaltation with an absolute accuracy of vision and authenticity of rhythm and then he says trying to walk back uh, that poem and improve upon it is foolish and then his advice to amal kiran he says sri aurobindo says you have a genuine vein of poetic inspiration somewhere above your intellect which comes through sometimes when the said intellect can be induced to be quiet and the lower vital does not meddle if i were you look sri aurobindo says this <laughs> if i were you i should try to find that always that genuine vein of poetic inspiration i should try to find that always and make the access to it free and the transcriptions from it pure for then your writing becomes marvelously good that would be a truer line of progress than these exercises 
Now I'm reading these lines with some pause because I want you to realize that this applies to some extent to all of us. Now, not all of us may have poetic genius waiting to manifest, although in potential, all of us could awaken to that, as we have seen in the result in the ashram of uh, all those who turned to the yoga force. But we will have certainly inspirations, intuitions of various kinds and forms. For some, it will be music, dance, writing, speech, action, work, inspired work equally is a stream of inspiration. But the point would be to connect to that somewhere above your intellect, which comes through sometimes when, when the intellect can be induced to be quiet and the lower vital does not meddle. Okay, so this should be our practice. And if perhaps the opium helped Coleridge to make his mind quiet, we have far better means to be able to do this through the practice of yoga and the methods of quieting the mind and opening to intuition. And then he explains what is to be done specifically. Find, find that always and make the access to it free and the transcriptions from it pure. Okay, three things. Find that always. Then bridge the link. Make the access to it free. And then the transcription from it pure. That means in a state of utter stillness, you receive what comes, let it flow and let it take its own forms of transcription. If you can do this, your power of creativity would be increased, and I'm not exaggerating when I say a thousandfold, because the creativity of the intellect is at best combinations and permutations of what it already knows or has seen. The creativity of the intuition and inspiration is something fundamentally new, which the intellect could not conceive, could not know by itself. And that's when what comes through has that power of genius. What drugs do, and we understand the utility of it, is to break the hard edges of the boundary and expose you to, to something wider momentarily. And I, I've been looking for the last few days for a good example of what is normal yogic development versus drug-induced breaking of boundaries. So at, I would take an example of your eyes. You see, in your eyes, you have the pupils, which can dilate to allow more light or less light. And so when you look in the dark, the pupils open to allow more light. Now you may say, I want to see better. I want to see more clearly. So you can put, inject some uh, chemical, which forces the pupils to dilate. And yes, of course, you will see more clearly, but at that point, it will also overwhelm your eyes and weaken the sensitivity of the surface that receives the light. Or what drugs would do even more effectively when sustained, you punch holes in your eyeballs. So much more light comes in and for a moment you're dazzled. But afterwards, the holes damage your normal ability to see. So what would be the healthy way to do it? You would train your eyes to become more sensitive, to be able to focus better. And with the growth of the eyes, natural evolution and the opening of the inner sight, you would begin to see things in their true reality, bypassing the limits of the physical eyeballs, which now become a support for the true sight, which replaces. So this is an example and analogy of how different the two approaches really are. There's also the question of microdosing, because this is considered to be uh, the in thing, because many industry leaders in Silicon Valley are using that. They take tiny amounts of drugs every day in their water, so it's a micro dose, not enough to give you a full high, but they say it helps them open their creativity because it somehow loosens the boundaries. It's a bit like someone says, I need to take alcohol to loosen my tongue, to be able to speak what I want to say. Otherwise, I'm too constricted. I can't speak freely what's in my mind. I'm afraid to speak freely, someone says. So he takes alcohol so that he can speak freely. The yogic way would be, Train yourself, purify, remove those boundaries which are blocking you consciously. Bring forward the truth speech 
or the consciousness, which is a frankness and openness, develop that, remove those artificial boundaries. So remember, our discussion here is in the context of the yoga. For those of us who aim to realize our full potential, human and spiritual, because we are spiritual beings finally, but the full potential is what we seek. Then these methods, which mo- provide some momentary exaggerated uh, responses are not worthwhile. So the same I would say for microdosing, not worth it. When through meditation, through concentration and through basic yogic practices, you can dramatically increase your creativity. And I will say within a few days, or if your power of concentration is not developed within a few weeks, you can dramatically increase your creativity. And we will be, we have already recovered this in some detail in our discussions on opening to higher states of consciousness and developing intuition. But we will be taking up questions about this, hopefully from next time on, if we finish today's series of questions. So yes, we have far superior ways of developing creativity. The question from Kazi about drug-induced art, uh, what is seen in those art is what the person experiences. Remember, art is a manifestation of an experience. That's when art becomes most effective. I've seen great artists, really extraordinary artists, opening to the vital world. And I'm speak, thinking now of one example where the artist drew a being of the vital world. It was an imp-like creature from the life worlds, perhaps seen among trees and plants. It was so living that when you looked at that painting, you felt the being alive. You felt his effect on you immediately. That's the power of art, to convey an experience, to make living that which is hidden or or, or, or unseen. When you open to the vital worlds, the best you could do is manifest those beings. What do they manifest in terms of consciousness? Perhaps some excitation, but nothing of value that lifts humanity. If anything, those energies create divisions, create conflicts, because that's all that they can do. They're small, lower vital beings. If they're higher vital, they can raise again, open the vital to something larger, but they fall short of our greater potential. Here, if you see what the mother did with the artists in the ashram, that's an indication of the direction to go into. What she did with Sunilda was to train his consciousness to receive the stream of a higher music. With Huta, what she did was to prepare her whole being, including her hands, to receive directly the flow of the higher form of painting and art. And there were many others in whom she worked who are perhaps not so well known as artist Preeti Ghosh. And uh, there were a few others who had similar when looking at the painting you feel as if you're glimpsing the higher worlds or even of the psychic domains sometimes and uh, there were others in dance for example with anuben i've mentioned some of these examples in earlier discussions aiming at the highest and the access there is had directly by opening of consciousness through the heart's love to the divine, as well as the mind's opening to the presence and perception of the divine, far more effectively, far more profound, and with a value that is eternal. The nature of true art is when you touch eternity and infinity in some way, and you catch a piece of that in form, in limitation of time. So this is uh, as far as these two questions go. I think we Thank can... you, Shradalo, for uh, it was almost like an introductory for our next session. So we thank you for reading from Sri Aurobindo. That was very uplifting uh, and uh, good comments <laughs> on the on the writer. So um, I will read um, another question from Sanjana on regarding the advice to have unconditional acceptance of a drug addict addiction as we talked previously what if this kind of unconditional acceptance makes the habit of the abuser become worse because the person perceives you as someone who will uh, accept anything from you 
Yes, it's a very important question. The question is, whenever you try to help somebody, the fact that you have an unconditional acceptance can also be misread and even misused. And this is most extreme in people who have addiction of any kind. I've seen also alcohol addictions, something similar. Uh, but we have to make a clear distinction in the unconditional acceptance. We accept the person and unconditionally. We do not accept the behavior. We distinguish the person from the behavior. We evoke directly the positive behavior, the higher possibilities of the person, point out to their greater, deeper creativities, that which is more true and innate to their inner being. These things are not theirs. These things are not them. These things are not acceptable as forms of action. So distinguishing the person from the behavior, this is the important thing. You see, in the yoga, this distinction is very important, especially in the integral yoga. A lot of people have this, and perhaps digressing, but you will see what, how this corresponds. A lot of people have this problem when they speak of surrender. Even Sri Aurobindo has asked this question, isn't the Gita contradicting itself? First, it says that you have to act. It tells Arjuna, Sri Krishna says, you have to act. And then he says, surrender everything, give everything to me, give up all dharmas. Isn't that a contradiction? In practice, a lot of us have this problem because on the one hand, we say everything has to be surrendered to the divine. And so people take a very convenient position of surrender. I have surrendered everything. Now, whatever happens is the divine will. No, that's not how it works. At the same time, when it comes to something they want, they will just do it. And it seems it is contradictory, of course. Or they will say, they will go to the extreme of surrender in becoming passive and then say, well, I don't have to do anything or I don't know what to do. Sri Aurobindo makes a clear distinction. The surrender is of your sense of I to the divine. Surrender there is combined with an effort to lift from our lower nature to our higher nature. So if you have tendencies and habits which do not match your ideal, well, you start changing them. That's an active work of change. And thus you make an effort to raise your nature to match, align with that to which you're surrendering. And it's only when the whole thing is raised fully that there is the total surrender of yourself. Until then, the surrender necessarily is partial because you can only surrender a part of you, but not the rest of your nature, isn't it? And even that part is very superficial because you're not yet aware of your own deeper and higher ranges. So there's a two phase. There's a double side. There's the consciousness and nature. Both have to be raised in the integral yoga. But there's a two phase. The first phase where the effort is included in the surrender process. And the final stage when all of you unified is then surrendered and surrendered entirely to become a conscious instrument. That's why in the Bhagavad Gita, that total surrender, abandoning all dharmas, is the culmination of the yoga itself. And it is something like this, even in dealing with, with the person who's struggling with an addiction, they have to go through that phase of that struggle. They have to refuse certain tendencies and actions, even though they uh, are struggling with it and recognize that what they are is different from their action, you are assisting them in this dual recognition. Shall we move on with yes. our next question? Uh, so Kwasi is asking, because we talk about uh, video games uh, addiction. So mm -hmm. she's asking, is there no way to enjoy the games without trapping <laughs> ourselves? <laughs> It's an interesting question because if you play a video game without immersing yourself, it's not fun. If you immerse yourself, well, you get trapped because it's designed to hook you. But this applies to all things in life, any kind of enjoyment for that matter, isn't it? You cannot truly enjoy if you don't fully identify with an experience or you are like a kind of a lotus eater an enjoyment at a distance, vicarious perhaps, but then it's not a full enjoyment. It's not seizing the full scope of the, of the delight even, of, or even the enjoyment or pleasure even. So how do you do this? And this is again an aspect of the yoga which we have to recognize. Uh, 
there's a part in you which has to fully engage in the work if it is to be fully um, effective but there's another part of you which also remains free this we call the purusha or the observing consciousness now the two are not initially separate so they are mixed in practice therefore initially there's an identification and there's a stepping back so let's say you're starting a work a project you step back look at the big picture these are the things i have to do this is how i'm going to do them you schedule it and now the first step when you execute your plan you enter and start doing at which point you are more and more immersed which goes fine as long as it's flowing according to plan and then when something happens which is not in your plan there's a shock you step back review now the changed situation against your plan modify your plan and then reengage so initially you have this movement of identification followed by stepping back followed by identification stepping back the two principles are alternating in time with the practice of yoga and these are the practices which we have to work on they don't happen just like that with the practice of yoga one trains oneself to be able to stand back in a part of the consciousness and then even when another part is fully engaged this part remains in the background and as a result the two poises are simultaneous in practice the part which is engaged may still step back and forth but the part which stands in the background as a support is never lost initially there's a phase where you start with this the witness position you engage and when you come back you realize ah the witness position was still there but you are involved and step back but the witness was still there and you come back to it it never left you have a sense of continuity later what happens is the duality becomes more and more vivid and that can at any point pull back or from there you can recognize ah there's a shift in the situation and from there the poise of correction is already taken and the executing consciousness moves without needing to step back totally because they are connected and this is operating independently and this comes with training of the consciousness and that would be the best way by which you can enjoy fully without being trapped and this is how you will enjoy life fully without being trapped but until then this phase wise alternation becomes necessary in practice this is compelled on us every day because at night we have to stop we have to step back we have to go to sleep or even between work when you are exhausted you're forced to stop and step back to some extent but if you can do this consciously you can do it frequently wherever in the work there's a transition point or a pause point let's say you're working in an office you get up you, let's say you have a break time for food or break time to go to the toilet transition between two meetings transition between two activities transition between two rooms whenever there's a change you make a pause step back recenter yourself as far as possible in the freedom of you yourself but whatever you can reach of it step back center yourself remember the mother look at the work done so far make a conscious offering of all this this we give, i gave to you look at the work to be done next perhaps even invoke the help and guidance for that and then plunge in once again so in practice you may end up with 20 or 30 brief stepping back poises during the day even when you stop to eat you may take a moment if you are with a, with people you don't even need to be seen to close your eyes just that moment of stepping back pause and it doesn't take much time it can be done in a few seconds but all this will be greatly aided if you start your day from that poise where you look at the work to be done today make a conscious invocation for the divine help and guidance and then begin the day from that poise so a short meditation concentration of deep immersion with the divine presence would be an excellent start and an excellent end of the day and then these frequent touches become very easy to practice but the question is important because it's not just with games the whole life is a video game for us 
and so it applies to life itself oh thank you for such practical uh, guidelines that was very helpful i hope many benefit from such a uh, good uh, practices we could um, um uh, could do we now go to another question or from mm-hmm. connor um there is a subject which uh, interested me for many years so <laughs> i'm happy to read this question what is uh, a yogic view on emotional trauma and things like post traumatic stress disorder the new age focuses very heavily on emotions and healing from trauma especially happened in childhood development saying things like all our past emotions are trapped in our bodies and need to be resolved what does happen to suppressed emotions and thoughts to what extent is it true what are some yogic methods of healing trauma and how does it distort our personalities <laughs> yes it's a very broad sweep in the question itself but the topic is extremely important so perhaps we may not be able to cover the full scope of what the question actually requires but a few indicative pointers and i will also draw on the experience both of joel and alina in their own work with uh, therapy but first uh, recognize that in the new age there's a lot of mixture and there's a tendency to exaggerate because every new age teacher has a ten- has a need to distinguish themselves from others that's their usp because that's i, I like to use this phrase that they are in a career of becoming teachers with a spiritual or otherwise doesn't matter and it's a career that they are running for purpose of a career you have to have a usp unique selling proposition which distinguishes you from others which automatically means you exaggerate something to distinguish yourself inevitably even there are people who have used shri rubindo and this is a topic perhaps we will discuss next time because there are questions relating to that even there are people who have used shri rubindo and claim to be representing shri rubindo's teaching but in order to be a teacher they have to have their own usp so they will disengage or exaggerate some part a very famous person who was almost entirely inspired by shri rubindo but later in life had to identify himself and he came for a lecture in the ashram school and he said well what i am going to say is very similar to shri rubindo but i differ from him on some points he had to start by distinguishing himself that he differed from shri rubindo <laughs> okay but so the problem with a lot of the new age philosophy or uh, teachings are these exaggerations many of them also draw heavily on the freudian framework where the starting point is body and matter as the basis and psychology as a phenomenon taking place even consciousness as a phenomenon taking place on top of matter therefore anything happening in the psychological domain has its roots in the physical or eventually settles in the physical now of course there's a truth to it and the truth is that yes our mind and life energies are embedded in the physical body as long as we are incarnating the body but the greater truth is that our mind and our life bodies are not physical fundamentally even if they are embedded right now they are not fundamentally physical they have their own laws their own principles so there is a truth to these statements that traumas tend to settle in the body but it also means that you can deal with them directly on their level without needing to first deal with the uh, the part which is attached to the body in fact releasing the trauma in the psycho spiritual domain may actually release the knot in the physical but it also works that you work to release the knot in the body there's a momentary relief but if the knot in the psychology is not removed then it reforms either the same knot or a different knot so those who deal only with the body processes to release knots will end up chasing knot after knot after knot and endingly unless the moment that first knot is released the person takes charge 
wakes up and breaks the psychological knot which also happens in which case it will be seen that oh yes body treatment healed the psychology but not always mostly it just goes back and forms new knots or repeats the same knot so you keep doing the same knot again and again and again until eventually the psychological habit itself thins out and dissolves and that's a very slow process ideally then we would address both we would work directly on the psychological cause as well as its physical roots if it has taken roots so now the question really is this what happens to suppressed emotions and thoughts depends if the thoughts and emotions are light not so strong well they fizzle out so yesterday i met somebody and he said something insulting and i felt the impulse to speak back and i held back the impulse i suppressed it it's gone i don't even remember it today perhaps it has no value but if this happens every day that i meet the person again and again for spend an hour with him each time and i each time suppress something then perhaps over a few days it may create a knot in my physical body but otherwise no it just dissipates it's the same with a lot of karmic things also you know many of the traditions which do not look at the spiritual reality you don't have the idea of soul or uh, or the divine reduce everything to karma mathematically no a lot of these things just fizzle out on their own their energy is put out they dissipate and so it is with our emotions also and with suppressed tendencies so not all th- things need to be taken to their biological roots but if there's a very strong trauma and ptsd post traumatic stress disorder is really relating to that a strong shock you've been in a war zone and perhaps you just missed being killed or you were asked to kill it was very interesting to see in vietnam when the united states was fighting the communists there they sent young americans who were totally unprepared they had just been trained and sent as cannon fodder to go out and kill or be killed for what was basically a political war after a point so it was interesting to see they would take the gun to aim at the vietnamese but somewhere inside they could not kill what would happen is in the act of shooting they would tilt the gun and the bullet would go up in the air they would aim at the person but as it came to squeezing the trigger they would tilt just enough that it would miss and this was happening again and again with them but you can see the struggle that would happen within you if you had to do that you are asked to kill you are made to squeeze a trigger you know you're going to kill an innocent person the villagers who have no arms you are asked to kill them and you can't and the struggle internally and made to happen repeatedly yes eventually it will create some knots and even lead to physical traumas and some of these things would appear in dreams and so on so ptsd really is is a fact when it, and it gets into the body when it is something of a very extreme kind of this this type and in such cases yes one has to also release the knot in the physical consciousness to get a full healing otherwise if you can deal with it on a psychological level eventually that also will soak down but not always it depends how deeply that knot has got buried something that happened especially at a developmental stage you might not be able to access unless you made the effort to enter and release the knot and i suppose that's where uh, one has to utilize those methods also some kind of a regression into that event and then now restating it or understanding it in new terms from a new light of your current evolutionary status would allow you to dissolve or free from that knot and it can happen immediately if it is correctly done even and sometimes the knot itself is so hard you're not allowed to reach it because the approach to it creates a trauma shakes you so much so you make small steps each time reviewing realigning until eventually you're able to face it and totally free but these of course are in the extreme uh, i want to actually take an examples or of any or comments which you have uh, both from alina and joel um, for those of you who have not listened to the previous sessions both of them are therapists and uh, joel is a certified therapist in family counseling and uh, alina is a certified therapist in uh, acupuncture as well as shiatsu and you have dealt with these kinds of things so i would be happy to hear something from both of you 
I could share something because uh, almost daily I'm working with people, uh, treating their health problems. And first of all, as you said before, as you mentioned, the um, system of self-defense is so strong mm -hmm. that not everyone would uh, allow you to talk about freely. And so I'm also very carefully when I, when I sometimes I'm engaging with people where they don't want to um, go deeper and understand the cause of their condition. Um, I've already studied many, many, ter many therapies and little sciences in this. So as you said, uh, Shadalu, uh, there's many, many approaches and everyone tends to create a, an own um, system of, whole, of a whole education. And I, I think for, 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 for people who don't approach life spiritually and or maybe they are not open uh, to um, a yogic or a, a, a spiritual approach um, to where they can withdraw their healing from, I think these kind of um, therapies are are highly recommendable and maybe would help them in treating their conditions. But as you said, and I, I have already noticed that, that when you treat um, from, um, just from a mental, uh, vital or physical um, level, maybe you treat that condition, but it can reappear if you don't work upon the, the true pattern itself. Because we always have desires, or we're always getting hurt if our needs are not satisfied. So just for example, we should go and work on a deeper level, not just um, on a superficial way. Okay. Then uh, another thing which I could share from my, my work is that uh, sometimes I'm massaging people. And as I said, where I feel I can go and ask more questions, uh, I, I do so. And I'm I'm surprised um, on on the on the back uh, feed the feedback that I receive and uh, for example there's girls uh, I just gave some examples so it makes yes. some some things clear um, I did massage um, a lot of girls who uh, when I do a manipulation they cannot open hips at all or uh, they have a very limited um, movement and I also feel somehow there's something that the, the person holds back and sometimes I ask them if, uh, if they experience any sexual abuse or maybe if their mom experienced that uh, experience of sexual abuse maybe she was conceived in a rape you don't you never know so many many times the girls confirmed and they said yes how did you know and they sometimes they start crying or sharing or maybe they can they don't want to talk about it um, same um, just the shoulders we express a lot of our relationships and then i see how some people have very blocked shoulders i know we are carrying our problems and difficulties on our shoulders and and you can feel when a person is anxious or stressed, you can see where that stress goes into the body. So it's reflected on the shoulders or some people um, have pain in the legs and then legs are very, uh, for example, they're connected with the earth. And then I ask them, do you have a, a strong connection with your mom? How is it? Is it painful, your relation? So Many people confirm, how did you, how did you came to that? And I, sometimes I explain them that, um, yes, we, we tend to store these emotions. And if we don't have a, an approach of a practice and releasing and surrendering as you before uh, advised us everything, then, um, of course, we get, uh, we get into these conditions. Um, same with law and karma and uh, our ancestors, because uh, we are just carrying a lot of their uh, information in our bodies. A lot of uh, energies or a lot of patterns are being expressed in our behaviors. And yeah, I see very often people who 
tend to have the same uh, problems like uh, their family. So I'm asking sometimes, uh, are you going through a divorce? But what happened to your mom? Where is your mom? Where is your dad? And when people start talking about it, they realize why I keep uh, repeating their patterns, why I cannot be me. So many people realize on, the, on their journey that uh, something is wrong. Um, I'm just um, uh, expressing something which is not me truly. It's a part of my family inside me. And uh, it's interesting to work with, uh, with these people and some, some uh, go for uh, just on a, a psychological approach. Some, they, they understand that they can get a, a higher help from above. And um, yeah. Just, uh, I could so, talk a lot about it, a, yes. a lot about this subject, but I think um, just to have a confirmation or maybe we can draw from Joel's. Uh, yeah. Joel's so in your Joel's approach, when you, when you see a patient or when you approach them, you're already sensing in yeah. some sense their energy, even Definitely. before there's a touch. Um, are you able to sense this? And is there a difference when you touch or when you have sensed already? Or is it Yes, this? definitely. Um, it can be also just seeing them. And then the moment when I touch them, I can see already a rigidity or a resistance. Yes. The body tissue is very hard, is harder. Mm. So that means you cannot really, uh, they're not very easily flexible or maybe they're more introvert. They cannot allow themselves to express mm. what they want. And some bodies, like yesterday, I work with a lady who she, she's a dancer, quite a famous dancer. So I, I could feel her body was just so aware, so light. And I just encouraged her to continue dancing, although she, she's now uh, having a family, so her career is uh, not the main focus. But I, can, I, I suggested to her, please work upon, and she said, how do you know? I, I'm really aware of my body. And she tells me how she feels any slight um, changes occurring in her body. So. So, yeah, it's beautiful to share with some people this kind of thing. So there are two things uh, Alina has brought in, which is very important. One is that you can also inherit certain tendencies because once the knot is in the biology, it also gets transferred uh, in the biology, sometimes from parents to children. And uh, mother makes this observation that at the moment of childbirth, we would think that it's the best that you give out, but that's not always the case. She said often <clears throat> in the mother, the instinct is th to throw out what is the worst in her in the act of childbirth. So unless there has been a conscious training and a con conscious intentionality with a higher purpose, even in the birthing, often the tendency is for the most heavy and dull material knots which get thrown out in the process. And the mother feels a great relief, but those knots are then part of the psychology and biology of the child even. And we inherit sometimes these tendencies without realizing they're not ours. Uh, the second observation, one, yes. Yeah, yes, one of the major works uh, which I used to do uh, using these uh, uh, healings, you would focus a lot on the project purpose. We call this period before conception, nine months uh, of pregnancy and first year of life. So a lot of the work is uh, based on this project purpose, which means, I mean, how you've been conceived, what was the environment, was there any, um, any um, will for, for the child to be birthed? Because of course you inherit that whole baggage of uh, <laughs> um, psychological uh, <laughs> um, approach, yes. yeah. And the second observation which you made also, which is extremely important, is uh, the way it represents in different parts of the body. So depending on the nature of the knot, the level of consciousness where the knot forms, it maps to different parts of the body. So things to do with the mind would tend to happen in this region of the head down to the neck. Things which deal with the higher vital would tend to be in the chest region and arms. Things with the lower vital would be in the abdominal region. Things with the purely physical would be below that, uh, from the below the stomach all the way to the feet. 
And it's interesting because automatically where the trauma comes, and it may not be a physical trauma, it may be a purely psychological trauma, for example, like in a divorce, the actual cause of the uh, divorce might be on different levels of consciousness. And then it tends to accumulate in that part of the body. Of course, if it is a physical trauma, then it may make a knot there. But generally, the trauma itself is not from the physical injury. Like you may get a bullet in your arm in the middle of a war, but it is not the arm where the pain is. The pain is in the emotional center where you had to do things which conflicted with your deepest uh, values. And so it will, the knot itself might be mapped differently from a physical injury. <laughs> Yeah, we have a whole section of, uh, for example, of books, which tells us, for example, what could be the psychological uh, mm -hmm. approach, conflict or trauma related with all diseases. And we named all diseases and all the possibilities that could be behind in helping to facilitate the person to, to heal. So, yes. yeah, so, <laughs> so. <laughs> Joel, would you like to share anything? Yes, uh, so, so what I could say is that me, I have stopped practicing. So I practiced for 10 years in psychosocial uh, environment, um, but I've stopped and I uh, also stopped because I was very, very disappointed with the results. I was seeing very little changes in people, at least not permanent changes. And I remember one of uh, my supervisor psychiatrist telling me when I shared with him uh, he told me there are very few people who want to change and even fewer who are able to change. And uh, it made me really, really wonder. So I'll be a bit radical. I do believe that at least in the field of psychotherapy that I've studied a little bit, I believe that without the spiritual component in it, the result will be very minimal. And I can, uh, I can draw on my own experience. So uh, to, to solve a kind of issue at the age of 25, trauma, abuse in childhood, I, I went uh, for psychotherapy. I went to, I uh, think, five different uh, psychotherapists, psychoanalyst, design analyst, hypnotherapist. And I got some results, uh, especially on the level of the heart. I was able to open a little bit. Uh, um, but it was a lot of work for very, very minimal results. I mean, I was... Uh, in quite in a depressive mood since a teenager, quite anxious. And those things didn't really evolve much. Um, but when I encountered spirituality, this I would like to share, it's a very, very interesting experience. While studying uh, Atta Yoga and other meditation practices uh, like 13 years ago, in one experience of contact with the divine love, all my symptoms of depression went away forever in one contact. Wow. So um, that was quite remarkable. I was totally astonished. Uh, the experience, the content of the experience of words, though it was an experience of love uh, through a calling for blessing on oneself and others, uh, the message was you are not alone. And, and that heal instantly all feeling of depression or depressive state, depressive mood that I was with, I always carried since teenager. Um, that was really like a gift. Um, and continuing my journey uh, as a patient, um, I've turned towards mother as a, my psychotherapist. Um, and she's for free and uh, she's almighty. <laughs> And uh, so going to matrimony every day, I really went there with that idea also is, okay, let's continue the healing process. And I must say, though, there's no discussion, like with a psychotherapist, uh, the transformation has been totally mind blowing. Um, not knowing precisely what aspect of my psychology she was working on, I saw with time the result and the change, and there are permanent changes. What I was uh, not observing in my patient or uh, the people I was uh, following, I had the feeling that those, per those changes were not permanent, that something was falling back to the whole habit. Here, even I was smoking cigarettes like uh, 10 years ago when I came to Oroville, and um, it went away completely. Uh, not like when people stop smoking, you know, it remains always kind of an effort 
uh, to avoid other people smoking. Either they have a repulsion or they have an attraction, but they have always a kind of conflict emotions regarding other smoking. Me, I can have somebody smoking me, next to me and feel the smoke and say like, oh yeah, okay, smells good. No, I'm not interested at all. So this type of uh, definitive healing and transformation, I have found it only um, uh, through the contact uh, with the divine. Now I would like just to share something because I don't want to, uh, to, 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 to bash too much psychotherapy and psychotherapists. There are many good advantages also. And, and one of the key ones for somebody who's interested in sadhana, me, what I have learned through my psychotherapies is to develop introspection and a sense of sincerity. Because when you look into oneself to see where are the knots and things, it becomes very useful for your spiritual practice further on, which is that, oh, okay, this needs transformation, this needs transformation. And um, it's much more easy because you have learned to be honest with yourself and seeing what are the weaknesses to be transformed. So that was my little uh, mm -hmm. contribution. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so we recognize the value of psychotherapy also as a therapy. But it's limitation because of the very model that it approaches, which is a bottom-up and pushing everything into the subconscious. Ideally, and there are people like that, uh, psychotherapists who come from a deeper understanding of the yoga psychology and particularly the integral yoga uh, psychology, which is much more profound than just basic yoga psychology. Uh, because normal yoga psychology is primarily oriented to the withdrawal from life, which is what you'll see in most of... Uh, what comes as yoga or as goal of yoga, even uh, as spiritual practices of all, all lineages. Integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo is the only yoga which aims at a manifestation and therefore deals with every part of consciousness in terms of its full potential to manifest the divine. And so as a psychological framework, it is far more profound, rich and complete than anything out there without exception. And so there are people who have this background to whatever degree, not always necessarily complete, but still, and who bring in these elements into their psychotherapy practice. And I've met people like that uh, in the West, particularly. It's interesting, I noticed that uh, many people in the West who have an innate spiritual aspiration and would have taken to a spiritual life if they had known about it, take to psychology as their uh, study specialization and then psychotherapy as their work because it automatically involves introspection, self-observation and uh, self-cultivation and then helping others do that. So effectively it becomes a kind of a practical yoga, but of course starting with a, back, uh, a framework which is still very uh, immature and raw, but then they through it they open to Sri Aurobindo and then begin to bring that knowledge into their practice. And of course, they have some of the most effective results. But the important point which, uh, which Joel highlighted is, unless there is this top-down change, the bottom-up change is never permanent or complete. Top-down change not only becomes permanent and complete, but it can be radical change in a very short time with a minimal struggle. And this is the advantage of the spiritual approach. So I think he has already answered uh, the question about yogic methods of healing trauma. But to generalize all the points which were covered both by Alina and uh, Joel, to generalize the yogic methods would be becoming conscious and then opening that of which you're conscious to the higher action of the divine. It's the most general way in which I could describe it. You cannot always become entirely conscious. But even if you're conscious of the blade of grass that comes out from the ground, you're not conscious of its roots. And they can be very extensive. Even if you're conscious of this blade of grass, you open it to the light of the sun, of the divine consciousness. Again, many ways to do that. Aspect of the divine mother as a shakti, aspect of the divine as, a, uh, as the divine principle above. Again, personal or impersonal, there are many ways in which you can relate. But just bringing that in relation to the divine is enough to start a process by which the divine light and force begin now to enter and through the blade of grass of which you alone are, you are aware only the force enters into the root system and begins to change from inside out this is the great power of the yogic approach because it does a top down a bottom up action cannot do that because you are always dealing with subconscious impulses and they don't have a capacity to change themselves a super conscious action can act to change everything so this would be a most general perhaps uh, response to the question 
we could go to the next question which is yes. aligned yes <laughs> Uh, so Kan Kanar is asking, what do you feel the Aurobindian Aurobindian view on shadow work or Carl Jung's concept of the shadow? It seems Jung's theories have quite a lot of truth in them, but it also seems he made some large errors and had quite some a few misunderstandings. Specifically, is there a truth? to the concept of projecting our parental wounds, inner repressed desires, shadow or unmet needs on all our situations in life, as well as needing to build healthy masculine and, he uh, and healthy feminine qualities and disconnecting ourselves from our, our parents' false concepts of us. It's in the same range of uh, topics. So yes. opening also from within, uh, and I met also many many of my teachers and other other, other psychologists who would use as a base this method. Um, but it would be good if people would have on their own um, this interest towards spirituality, because. Um, It's hard only at once, in one session, going to a psychotherapist to do the whole uh, uh, working, opening within or from above. And so people, um, people want to have more uh, practical uh, mm -hmm. therapies or, uh, yes. Yes. So again, the way Connor has uh, articulated his question is very, very broad. And I'm very not broad. sure we will do full justice to it, <laughs> but still. Just a uh, initial quick comments, and then I will also ask uh, Joel's uh, observations on this. Uh, this whole term shadow work and the shadow is uh, for me a bit problematic because it assumes wherever there's light, there'll be a shadow. And shadow represents, because the shadow has to be there in some form. That's an assumption, impl implication. And the Shadow is used to describe anything that we are not conscious of. And necessarily in the thinking itself and in the vocabulary, that is representing something negative, something dark, something contrary to that which is lit up, which is positive. Somehow this implication is always there. You may not always make it explicit, but it's always there. The problem with this model is that all that is unknown to us is considered shadow when in fact the bulk of what is unknown to us is light and is super conscious or is subliminal, but is lit up and extremely aware, extremely developed even perhaps, but unknown to us or unconscious. And all that would be also thrown into shadow if they were aware of it. So the implication of shadow work is always about something negative and there's no recognition of uh, that higher possibility. So this is a problem first with the term itself and then the whole associated nature of shadow work, which, uh, which comes in with that theory. So yes, there's some truth to it. There's an exaggeration which comes from it and all of it is burying everything into the subconscious when in fact it is bulk of it maybe in the superconscious. This is a point Sri Aurobindo makes in fact regarding all these theories. Um, Projecting parental wounds, inner repressed desires, unmet needs, etc. All these are, of course, part of human life. None of them need become a serious problem. All depends on how one deals with them. I'm just going to put it in this way. Let's say you have a parent, sibling, friend, boss, whatever, who is a cause of great wound potentially. The person is always criticizing or is always negative or whatever. A lot depends on how you receive it. If you looked at it and say, oh, poor fellow, there's so many problems. Oh, he's always unhappy. You're actually in a state of consciousness where not only you are immune, but you have something positive to give them if at all they are willing to receive. But you are effectively immune to that. But if every day you tell yourself, oh no, once again he is going to harass me, oh I'm feeling so bad, oh I'm feeling miserable, he made me miserable. You are slipping, sliding into a dark zone. 
the person may be exactly the same and you may actually end up feeding them in a negative loop you'll end up feeding them the person may be exactly the same but how you approach it will change the effect on you so projecting parental wounds inner repressed desires unmet needs etc none of them need be cause for a problem it all depends on how you approach them i've shared here the example of uh, what i learned from uh, dr d v joshi who was the head of our laboratory he passed away only this year at the age of 96 uh, he said to me one day when he was in college age 21 he just woke up and had this clear realization he said to be happy is my choice nobody can take that away from me nobody has the power to make me unhappy if i choose to be happy and he said from this point on i have decided i will never again be unhappy and it's a fact he said from the age of 21 once he had that realization he was never unhappy whatever happened in life he said ah okay but i'm not going to be unhappy that choice automatically frees you from bulk of all these things so yes shadow work has its value but how about light work <laughs> if i may play with that idea how about changing how we relate to pressures of life and then when need not get sucked into these problems of course the ability to do this requires that something in you is related either to your psychic presence or the higher divine help because that's the only light which can be permanently lit any constructed or pretentious form of light or optimism will eventually break under some pressure there are people with very strong positive optimistic vital but even they can sustain that optimism only if there's some deeper psych, uh, spiritual or psychic influence so somebody has just put this question online right now uh, asking how important or urgent is it to shift the center of consciousness and uh, for coming out of these influences etc yes this is the whole point it is the single most urgent thing nothing else matters more than this contact and then growing influence either of the divine within or the divine above or around or even an idea of the divine to which you connect and open to the fact that there is a link is enough for you to completely change the outcome that circumstances have on you circumstances may not change but how you re- receive their result or their impact is completely different so for me this would be the the thing to emphasize more than the the shadow work again like i said it's not a comprehensive treatment of the topic but it's a it's a general indicator of the approach and i don't know if joel or alina would like to add no uh, me i don't have much to add so oh, something you have already said just before uh, so me most of this knowledge i have forgotten um i read it and i forget it especially since i discovered the extensive and most comprehensive and making totally sense psychology uh, uh described by mother in shermin do i remember uh, reading the letters of yoga and having so many insights saying okay this is the real thing this is the real thing this is the real thing so like you said if we rebuild the psychology or an approach based on what they are explaining okay then we we have something uh Uh, really worth that's it thank you thank Alina, you Joel, for sharing um no i would just add that each time yes when i'm facing a situation where i don't feel comfortable or with someone uh, who is uh, criticizing or i'm trying always to see him as a collaborator for my own uh, progress so if he can press some buttons in me and there's something coming up then he he's showing me over and over again on what i have to still work upon and what i still have to transform or or what is uh, still to be worked upon <laughs> yes yeah, so we are almost close to our very end of the uh, of the session so would you take another last question yes we can take from, the last question from professor paramanshwaran student 
Why should current youth read Sri Aurobindo's and the mother's works? What knowledge will youth get from their writings that connect, that can connect them with pressing issues of modern life and career? What are the basic writings of the masters to start with, especially for those who are yet to feel the spiritual call, but are bound by compulsions of family and world and relationships? I think it's a beautiful question to end with. Yes. Many of us feel the need to inculcate in our children, students, friends, the same joy that we have in reading or learning from Sri Aurobindo and the mother. I've seen many families where that transmission was reduced to just offering prayers. But if there was not a transmission of this joy of learning and growing, then often the value of what is given fades. But this question is there in the minds of the youth because in the minds of the youth, spirituality is something that you take up after you retire. Everything they've been taught about spirituality is about detachment. Don't get enjoy. Don't get trapped. Don't get caught. Withdraw. Don't follow your desires. Don't be egoistic. Don't have fun. You have to be serious. So all the associations of spirituality are with an ascetic life. So the moment you say Sri Aurobindo, the Sri itself tells you, ah, this is a spiritual guy and he's going to ask me to withdraw from life, from monasticism. I'm not interested. And they, they will tell you in so many words, and I've heard this from so many, right now I want to enjoy my life. And then later, when I retire, I will turn to spirituality. This is so deeply rooted. And unfortunately, it is perpetuated by the whole educational system itself, which looks upon spirituality only in terms of asceticism. So, to the question, why should you read Sri Aurobindo and the Mother's works? Because it will help you enjoy your life truly. Because they will give you the means by which not, to, not only you can enjoy fully, but you can maximize the learning potential of your life and the creative potential of yourself. Why? Because what they teach is not asceticism. What they teach is perfection of life. And perfection of life in knowledge, in power, in full enjoyment, and in perfection and beauty of manifestation. Therefore, turn to them because what they, the spirituality they bring is fundamentally different. It is life affirming, life fulfilling, life enjoying. Fully, truly. And I make a distinction. What is not true enjoyment? What is not full enjoyment? When you enjoy and, you're fo and it is followed by the negative enjoyment, suffering. I ate so much good food. Now I'm come back and I'm sick. I feel revulsion when I think of the food that I ate. That's not true enjoyment. The true enjoyment is when you can eat and eat and eat and eat all you want, as much as you want, as long as you want, with full delight of everything that you ate. That's how the soul is going to enjoy the world. And also your body can enjoy. So what is going to make it possible for you to truly enjoy? And in this way, I mean it. To be able to eat all you want, as much as you want. And you, you will recall Sri Aurobindo's, uh, the phrase is, is still vivid in my mind. In his commentary on the Isha Upanishad, there's the whole section, the rule of the divine life. Tena tyaktena bhunji tha in Sanskrit. By that renounced, thou shouldst enjoy. That is the affirmation of the Veda. You're meant to enjoy life. But the rule of true enjoyment is that it should be without attachment. So when the food comes, you enjoy it. When the food goes, you can enjoy. It's going away equally or the meeting of another food. I'm using food also in a very symbolic way because all life experience is food for the soul. All is nourishing you in some way, giving you the means for your growth. And so everything is meant to be enjoyed. But there's a way by which you can enjoy without the negation of the enjoyment. But that's not all. That's not all. If that was all, then it would be still, uh, it's, it's worth it, but it's not all. There's much more. And 
I want to compare here. I'm, I will read from a portion of Sri Aurobindo where he, from one of his letters, where he describes in what way he is different. He says that, and it was in a response to a question on the Bhagavad Gita. That uh, he says it is not a fact that the Gita gives the whole base of Sri Aurobindo's message. For the Gita seems to admit the cessation of birth in the world as the ultimate aim, or at least the ultimate culmination of yoga. It does not bring forward the idea of spiritual evolution or the idea of the higher planes and the supramental truth consciousness and the bringing down of the consciousness as the means of the complete transformation of earthly life. Now, all this is special to Sri Aurobindo, which is not there in the Gita. What is special? The idea of a spiritual evolution. That here we are in the midst of an evolution. Of course, there's a biological and psychological evolution. But we are much more as part of a spiritual evolution where our spiritual potential itself is growing. Your ability to perceive reality, your ability to experience reality, your ability to engage with reality and shape, organize, act upon and change it. All of these grow with the heightening, deepening and widening of your consciousness. As a result, it will have its effect on your mind, life and body's capacities by deepening, widening and heightening them also. So the nature of the spiritual evolution has enormous impact on the entirety of your personality and even your body, but on your entire experience of life. There's no withdrawal here. It is all about fulfillment in life. Okay. So the idea of spiritual evolution, just this changes everything. But into this, he brings something else. The idea of higher planes and the supramental truth consciousness. Now, without going into details of what that means, it means everything you can imagine today in terms of what you might be capable of in your highest, greatest potential is still of a certain limited domain of consciousness. There are things you cannot imagine are possible as experiences in the higher gradations. Experiences of infinity of knowledge, infinity of power, infinity of beauty and delight, of bliss, of profound peace, so solid, so vast that it can support an entire universe. Experiences of intense power, so intense that they could shatter the whole universe in a single kick. All these are part of the world experience you will have, of which you can also become an agent of manifestation or bring that power to act, to change your circumstances and shape them as a creative expression of your life. And this is, I'm saying only as a glimpse of potentialities of higher planes, all the way to the supramental truth consciousness, which means you have the totality of knowledge and power and delight. Unmixed, infinite, Unendingly. Diverse. And. Surprising. In its potential. And all of this can be brought down. To make a complete transformation of earthly life. Now all this is what he is offering. Which is not there in the Gita. Which is not there in any of the other spiritual traditions. Anywhere in the world today. Okay, then the letter continues. The idea of the super mind, the truth consciousness, is there in the Rig Veda, according to Sri Aurobindo's interpretation. Others say it's not there. And in one or two passages of the Upanishads, but in the Upanishads, it is there only in seed, in the conception of the being of knowledge. I skip all that. It is not developed, and even the principle of it has disappeared from the Hindu tradition. So what Sri Aurobindo represents is not Hinduism as it is currently known. It may be the origin of Hinduism, if at all, but it, it goes far beyond that. But it does not stop with what Hinduism offers today. It is these things, among others, that constitute the novelty of Sri Aurobindo's message as compared with the Hindu tradition. Okay, Among others, there are other things also which Sri Aurobindo brings. And now he shows the difference in certain areas. The idea that the world is not either a creation of Maya or only a play of Leela or the 
divine or a cycle of births in the ignorance from which we have to escape this is what comes in many of the existing traditions within hinduism so it's none of these let's look at what they, what it is not so the world is a creation of maya this is one of the vedantic major schools today so prominent that for many this is hinduism so it is a maya a creative uh, or even a deceptive power of illusion which creates the world and so well you have to get out of the illusion that's the only conclusion or other traditions which say oh it is only a play of the divine so well you just participate in the play for as long as it lasts then you drop out of the play and go back to merge in the divine but you are only in transition here or a cycle of births in the ignorance from which we have to escape this is another major tradition which is also a global imprint that here you have only suffering you have only ignorance you want to get free of the ignorance well you have to step out escape you cannot be free here and again there you enter a state in which you are free from the ignorance during the lifetime and eventually your body sheds and you withdraw that's it these are the various broad traditions associated with hinduism then there are the religions which will simply say you you do your you obey the rule book and then you get rewarded or punished in heaven and hell we don't look at that now so it is none of these that sri aurobindo teaches what does he teach he says the world is a field of manifestation in which there is a progressive evolution of the soul and the nature in matter and from matter through life and mind to what is beyond mind till it reaches the complete revelation of sachidananda in life now this is the scheme sri aurobindo offers us as the sense of purpose of our birth in the world and the world itself that this is a field of manifestation we have come here to manifest make many give form to all that is potential in the divine so field of a progressive field of manifestation in which there is a progressive evolution of the soul and the nature so soul grows you grow in consciousness i am more mature but also my nature changes my body grows in capacity my heart and emotions grow in their richness of experience my mind grows in its possibilities and all these first we grow in matter what we create here in the material experience of life then they grow in life and its possibilities then they grow in mind and its possibilities and go on growing to high through those high gradations until the full possibility of the sachidananda is not only experienced but fully manifested and revealed through your mind through your life through your body entirely there's nothing which you can say ah that cannot come down that is too pure for the material world to express all possibilities of sachidananda are meant to be expressed of course the evolution will take time until they can express all possibilities potentially unendingly and that's what makes this spiritual evolution itself without limit there is no point where you'll ever be bored every time that something extraordinary is manifested you'll say wow what a wonderful thing and what else and there's something even more wonderful beyond your capacity to imagine and a delight far greater than you could imagine waiting still to be revealed such is the nature the complete revelation of sachidananda in life nothing left out you see the the goal is so great nothing is there which is not worthy of matter matter itself is a sacred domain for the full manifestation not yet capable of it but potentially capable of it and then he says it is this that is the basis of the yoga and gives a new sense to life what is that sense the sacredness of the universe the extraordinary opportunity that this birth gives to us which is not possible in any of the higher domains of the subtler and higher worlds only possible in matter only possible by taking birth in the body and that's why this world that's why we are born that's our purpose of life now when this vision of spirituality is shown and of course i've given it in a very succinct form elaborate it give examples of what is possible of course for 
young children whose minds are not prepared this is still perhaps too abstract but start with examples which are accessible and then notice how whatever your deepest and highest aspiration desire hope dream ideal all of these are intended to be made real in life and that's what this yoga teaches you how to make that possible which no other system teaches you no other yoga or religion teaches you how to make possible that which is your highest ideal or dream and it make teaches you in methods using methods which are extremely practical extremely effective and powerful experiences or realizations which in the other paths may involve an entire lifetime of effort can be actually realized here within weeks months because the method the approach itself is different and all this is taught to you in the writings of sri rubindo and the mother not only that so the question to the part of the question where he asks uh, what can these writings give you for pressing issues of modern life and career everything because the goal is this full realization and manifestation nothing in life has been left out in the coverage and scope of sri rubindo's writings the mother says this he has given you everything now it may sound like an exaggeration but this is a fact because he has expressed all the seed core concepts of knowledge and these are memes these are holographic uh focal points because they repeat everywhere in all fields on all levels you catch the principle and then you can see how it applies in every activity i read sri rubindo on education and i get insights on artificial intelligence programming i read his writings on uh, political uh, thought and uh, human unity and i get knowledge of governance administration law you read his philosophical discussions and you will sharpen your brain your mind as nothing else can do nuances subtleties literally your mind is reshaped into the image of what he lived so for those who are yet to speak, feel, uh, to feel the spiritual call we will start with your current ideal and dream whatever that is and you will have all the tools necessary to be able to realize them and the point though is it is power of the spirit which is going to be tapped for your material realization even if that's your starting point sri rubindo himself you will recall start turned to yoga with the intention of gaining power to free india from colonial rule because he saw a yogi perform what was effectively a miracle to heal somebody he said ah yes if spirituality can give power for that it can give me power to free the country that's how he entered let that be your entry point as you enter the practice itself you will change because you will awaken to your own deeper and higher dreams and those two will are meant to be realized the questioner though has a, a flaw in the questioning for those who are yet to feel the spiritual call but are bound by compulsions of family and world and relationships so this idea that family world and relationships bind you from the spiritual call is an idea that belongs to to the ascetic goals these are the things which prevent you from the asceticism but for a life affirming spirituality all of these are your field of action for spirituality family is your immediate domain your sangha <laughs> into which you have to bring those higher values that you wish to live world is the larger sangha relationships are the domain where you have to now bring a completely different uh, approach the three characteristics of the integral yoga which he shurbindo describes as outstanding characteristics which do not belong to any other system of yoga or religion or psychological training the first is that there is no fixed sequence there are methods there are processes but they are not fixed they are often parallel and there is a shift in emphasis so that is one second 
is that there is no precondition to take up the yoga. You can begin wherever you are in your current development. Unlike other systems where you must have this particular requirement of temperament, only then you can follow that system here. Because it is all inclusive in a total transformation, you start from where you are, as you are, and grow from there to your full potential. Third, it does not require you to withdraw from any activity of life because all activities are meant to be transformed. So nothing in life needs to be rejected. And this is the part I want to highlight. Whatever you have as circumstances around you, whatever you have as strengths or weaknesses within you, they are your starting point. They are your field of growth and exploration in this spiritual evolution for a complete transformation of your life. So I think this is again a very broad framework as a response. I'm not going to details of what else Sri Aurobindo and the mother can give you. But if we understand this fully, whatever your age, whatever your interest or priority in life, you will find that there is nothing which gives you a more complete means to realize your interest. This change is extremely important. We will have occasion to discuss it perhaps next time and the next few sessions, which will deal with the nature of this yoga, planes of consciousness, as well as practices and the questions around those things. And so we'll be elaborating a lot more on this. But you must understand that this is something unique and entirely different from all existing yoga traditions and religions and philosophies. Go over these key points that Sri Aurobindo mentions again and again, because they're so unique and so new that it will change entirely the way you look at the world. This entire universe, including the physical universe, is body of Satchidananda. Your body is a vehicle to manifest Satchidananda and touch and enjoy Satchidananda, that is universe. the place of matter, the place of your body, the place of your individuality in the universe undergoes a complete change. And if you do not completely change your way of looking at things, you will never fully understand what this yoga is about. So take time to work on it, to change your perspective. It took me a few years actually to make the complete shift. But when you do this, what it will open to you, the sense of purpose, the sense of priorities, and the potentialities and the joy of the journey itself will be the greatest gift that you will have. That Sri Aurobindo and the mother took birth on earth to teach this to us and give us these means, give us the example and give us the physical presence and the contact with their personality is the divine grace and gift that we all have. And we are still very close to that event of their manifestation to be able to feel still very vividly the power of what they have brought. We can take a moment to concentrate on this, hold this, perhaps center ourselves in aspiration or just in gratitude. Thank you and namaste. Thank you. Namaste.